Welcome to another episode of Systematic Geekology. This is a space where we seek to create and cultivate healthy conversations between those things we geek out on and the philosophical and theological questions that often arise out of our fandoms. Like, what does it mean to be human? What makes a hero? What makes a villain? How do the stories and narratives we geek out on shape how we live in the world? We are your priest to the geeks. We aren't all ordained, but we see ourselves as mediators at the intersection of geek culture and going deeper in our faith. We don't always have to agree, but we do respect each other and we see everyone as a beloved child of God. Everyone geeks out on something, so come geek out with us and enjoy the show. You're listening to an Anazal Ministries podcast. What happens when regeneration isn't enough to heal a broken heart? Hearts? Multiple hearts? Yes, that's right. We're talking about the Doctor Who 2023 specials featuring David Tennant in another episode of What's News? Guys, I can't wait to jump to this one. If you're watching live, go ahead and shout out below where you're listening from so we can announce it here. If you're not, we hope you just enjoy the show. I'm one of your co-hosts, Joshua Knoll. Um, man, uh, sometimes I like to talk about geeking out on, and sometimes I just like to do like a quick geek flex. It's been 10 days in a row that I've worn a different pair of Captain America socks every day, and I'm just seeing how long I can keep this going. I didn't realize how many Captain America socks I own, but I'm proud of it. And also... One oh thing, gosh. another thing I'm proud of is a dear friend of mine who helps host this show, Chris Ashley. How's it going, Christian? Hey, Joshua. I'm all right, man. I'm used to dealing with you, so it yeah. just is what it is. You, you want to share some geek cred or anything real quick? <laughs> I don't know. We breaking the rules of your own schemes for this format of the What's News? Yes. <laughs> sure. Uh, I am almost done with Birth by Sleep. I'm so close. Uh, I am skipping all those yeah, terrible yeah. ice cream mini games and fruit ball mini games just so I can get to the good parts. I yeah, I don't blame you. I'm platinum mean everything for some reason. Awful, awful times. But what's not awful? What's always a wonder is when you get to see the beautiful face. I, the first time he's been on this show, but he has been on another show with me, the Whole Church Podcast. We've had him guest, and I'm excited to have the one and only Reverend Justin Coleman from um, I forget the name of your church. I know it's the Methodist Church on campus yes. of UNC Chapel Hill. Um, yeah. I, it's against my DNA. yeah, it's against my DNA to say go Tar Heels, but uh, go Reverend <laughs> Justin. I could say that. <laughs> oh, man, That's man. just fine. That is just fine. Yeah. University United Methodist Church in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Nice. Nice. And uh, y- you want to do uh, any any geek flexing real quick? I know you've seen yeah. these specials more than once. <laughs> So, you know, I, I will do just before we get to who, let me do a, a, a geek flex around um, <laughs> uh, Star Trek. So I think I have seen probably for the last three weeks, Patrick Stewart has either been um, in an audiobook or on screen for me this whole time, either with his yeah. memoir, Make It So, um, uh, Making It So, um, Watching him as Ebenezer Scrooge <laughs> in a Christmas. That's girl. a good one. <laughs> and, yes. and catching a little bit of uh, classic, what one might call, I guess, now classic next generation. Oh, man. Yeah. yeah. Man, that's good stuff. I always love when you get to see or hear his voice. And what's interesting is uh, recently, Christian and I, which everybody listening can go check it out if you haven't yet, we did a, one of our driving episodes where we just kind of do a quick review of a movie. Um, we did the Nightmare Before Christmas and talked about originally they had Patrick Stewart do the opening and ending of that film. Really? And, uh, yeah, and it's actually on the album still. So if you're on Spotify, you can you can hear him do the the in and out of the movie, and it's like wow, that was better. Like I still love the movie. Like it's, it's hard to make that movie any better, but th- that might have done it. That might yeah, have done it. I um, mean, check that out. So I don't have any shout outs from where anyone's from yet. So if you're if you joining live later let us know where you're from we'll shout you out a little bit later for now we're going to jump into what's known as our lightning round 
where we're going to discuss uh, what's new, what is uh, what we have seen or been reading recently that isn't our main topic for the day. Just giving a shout out to a couple other things. Um, if you want to check out our comic book catch-up, you can hear me talk about Hillboy Yule Cat. That's my favorite holiday thing this year. Um, other than that, what's new? Disney's Wish was definitely underrated. People just hate it because they want to hate something. That's my take. Yeah. <laughs> Christian, you have anything for our lightning round of our what's new? Yeah, I haven't seen Wish yet. I've heard all the outrage and whatever, so I'll just watch the movie <laughs> on my own and decide whether I like yeah. it or not. Um, so I'm still watching Monarch uh, Legacy of Monsters. I need to check uh, that, that latest episode. It wasn't my favorite, but it wasn't like the worst thing in the world. Like I, I'm still enjoying it. I'm still in it to win it. I want to see more of my big, big G on screen as time goes on there and that. Uh, the flashbacks are pretty good. And then uh, other than that... Uh, let's see what else have I been doing. Oh, Ultraman Blazar is still amazing right now. We're getting closer to the finale there. The conspiracy is trying to get worked out by the crew, trying to figure out like what's going on there. Really enjoying Ultraman Blazar. And last but not least, I'll go with the Faraway Paladin season two is about to end right now, and they're confronting their, the big bad dragon naming after this whole season. I'm ready for that. Is if you want a good example of a good isekai, go watch the Faraway Paladin. Mm. Mm. All right, uh, Reverend Justin, you have anything? Uh, what's new that's not our main topic today that's been coming out recently? You've been into? Well, Christian uh, named one of them because I was going to talk about Monarch, which mm -hmm. has been uh, really mm -hmm. interesting. And uh, like you say, I'm glad about the flashbacks. Um, I'm interested to see where all this goes. Uh, it's mm -hmm. been a fun uh, series. It's kind of a, a slow burn, but a good, but a good one. Um, and yeah. uh, though it's a little bit sci-fi adjacent, the um, um, no, I think it's it's I think it, it, it works for sci-fi. The um, uh, for all mankind. I don't know if you've seen this show. I have really yeah, enjoyed it. it. It the the whole premise of the the show. It's got I think three into its third season now. Is you know what how would it have reshaped history and primarily the American uh, psyche if we did not win the space race? Yeah. Uh, and it is, it's like one of the coolest um, science fiction shows that uh, like no one is watching. Uh, so for all, I mean, for all mankind is, is, and they didn't do humankind because it starts you know, back in the sixties. Right. Oh, yeah. 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 When um yeah, my dad's where been do I watch that this one up a lot. Where's it at? Um, I watch it on uh Apple um TV. I mean the the so, Apple TV station, whatever you call it. I think it. I'm gonna have to cave and get Apple TV. I tried so hard not to get it because it's like there's not a ton that I care about, but I do. I just so badly want to see Monarch. I'm about to just do like at least. Yeah. Does, does Apple TV have a free trial? I might have to. <laughs> I, have a, I have a day off tomorrow, but just you know. Well, <laughs> well you might want to wait till the whole thing's done, then you can True. binge it true good idea with good idea drive. christian with with the wisdom here um see i, I was, I was going to go like around everybody do one but y'all y'all just dumped everything because christian did everything <laughs> you christian led a bad example now i have to yeah. um <laughs> well that's because you don't have the slides like yeah. you should well, joshua you, know, you didn't ask us it's fine it's fine i'm leading bad examples too today we're just raw and we're just kind of stumbling and you know it's uh what's we'll say real real people real podcasts live stuff you know it just happens um no, for those who listen to our short stories episode, I am already on my first Madeline Miller novel. So I'm going through the Song of Achilles. Oh, that's so good. It's incredible. Um, as far as stuff that's actually new, really, I've been digging a lot of these trailers that have been coming out recently, looking at that Godzilla X Kong, the new empire, um, mm -hmm. some of the other the trailers for like Echo, some of the mm -hmm. stuff that Marvel is going to be putting out Deadpool. We, we have a lot to be excited for next year tvs movies games i'm like this is uh it's gonna be a big year i'm i'm already thinking i might get a ps5 i'm like ah i might have to finally cave <laughs> i've been holding out but we got good <laughs> games good movies coming out next year 2024 is gonna be huge and doctor who will be like back full swing yeah, so, yeah. oh, oh and speaking of new games they did reveal a blade game that i'm not sure yeah. whether it's, whether it's yeah, just gonna be on that's Xbox one of the trailers or if it's gonna be all over uh for all platforms but either way i, I really want it i need it bad it looks so cool 
That looked so cool. Yeah, the Game Awards yeah. this year, the Game Awards have just become a second E3 where they're just announcing games, really. It's really all it's about. Now I'm okay with it. I'm here for it. But what I'm more here for... E3's gone for good now, apparently. Uh, but what I'm more here for is to talk about Doctor Who. And of course, the one, the only, David Tennant is back. Which you know, that means... I get to talk about David Tennant. I get to say allons-y as much as possible. And no one can really judge me too much for it now. Because it's like, oh, I guess that's relevant again. And I'm going to go ahead and let you guys know. That there's going to be spoilers. If you haven't seen it, stop and watch it. Or just skip the ones you have seen, haven't seen, you know, whatever. Or if you don't care about spoilers like me, let me just tell you. Um, a lot recently that I've been aggravated with like TV show runners and stuff where they're like, um, I watched the golden bachelor with my wife and it's like, Oh, it's going to be such a huge twist, such a huge surprise at the end. And I'm like, I bet they get married. Wow. They got married, you know? And it's like, they keep doing this thing where they tell us huge twists, like with MCU and stuff. And I'm like, I've got to the point where I don't believe show writers anymore. when they say huge twist. I should have believed Russell T. Davies. <laughs> there was a huge yeah. twist, man. Yeah. <sighs> I can't wait to get into it. And we're going to do what he did to me and make everybody wait to talk about that huge twist. Because we're going to start with the first special, The Star Beast. Uh, first reactions, Justin, we've been waiting. We finally get, you know, I know some people love Jodie Whittaker's take. I liked her as the doctor. I didn't like the show with Chris Chibnall. A lot of us have been waiting. David Tennant coming back with Russell T. Davis as the showrunner. For those who don't know, just a little bit of backstory. Russell T. Davies left the show originally because his husband had cancer. He went through a lot, which mm -hmm. actually does inform the show because you see where he writes this like hurt, this healing process into what all is going on with these three specials. And it's incredible. Um, my first take, the Star Beast, I was like, okay. You know, I was waiting for a David Tennant Doctor Who come back. I, I loved it, but it was like, oh, this is just a normal David Tennant Doctor Who. And the more I sat on it, the more I was like, oh yeah, this is what I liked about Doctor Who. This is what it's supposed to be. Even though it was a normal episode, it was like, okay, we're just getting back to what it was supposed to be before we do any of the other stuff. That was my first reaction. Uh, what about you, Reverend Justin? What, do you, what were you thinking? So I have a very similar feeling because this needed to be, uh, given all the tensions in the Who fan base, which at some point we can talk about because I'm not I'm not always in agreement with the with the overall uh, fan base. For instance, uh, Capaldi and Jenna Coleman loved that duo. Oh, and me too. Me too. And and not everyone, not everyone does. But this needed to be a, a reset. And I think the wisdom of bringing bringing David Tennant back was was that there's been so much tension in the fan base, and for who to continue well, we needed this. And I had a very similar feeling that you had. It started, and I and I thought, oh. This is what Doctor Who's supposed to feel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, again, I I really appreciated uh, Jodie Whittaker's Doctor, and with a different writing and them not trying to mm -hmm. do so much at once, which we'll come back to. Um, <laughs> without them trying to do so much at once, I think that could have been a great run. But oh, this yeah. uh, this had some feeling of that modern day classic doctor who that we have all come to love oh yeah yeah it really like it felt like uh with the timeless child which Chris and i have spoken about recently on another episode so go check that out guys um in the show notes below we'll have all the doctor who episodes we've ever done the most recent one before this is one i'm talking about um but the yeah it felt like with the timeless child stuff it was almost like they took the doctor's past and made it into a jigsaw puzzle and was just playing around more on that later christian yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I can't. I couldn't. Like, I just do that quick reference. And then, uh, yeah, they kind of brought it back to what it was supposed to be. I, just, I, I like that Reverend Justin's with me. Christian, be the odd one out. Tell us you hated it. <laughs> well, I can't do that. That'd be lying, and lying's a sin. Um, <laughs> because, man, this was a return to form for me. I was thinking, like, in the back of my mind, why couldn't Jody have had a writer like this during yes. her tenure as the doctor? Like, that woman yeah. deserved better. And, like, it's like, is it just fan service that David Tennant is back? No, as we will find out later, there's an actual character purpose to the Doctor having that face again. This is what I wanted. Mm -hmm. uh, during the tenure of the 13th, like, there were some good mm -hmm. ones in there every now and then. For the most part, I just wasn't in it to win it. Yeah. Here, I'm back. All three of these, 
I have very little bad to say about him. Yeah. yeah. One might say number 13 was rather unlucky. Um, but, but <laughs> the, no, I, yeah, I, we both brought, we all brought this up. So let's, let's pause for a minute. A lot of the who fan based actually are, are kind of torn about David Tennant coming back. A lot of people, even Peter Capaldi said something about how, no, part of the point of the doctor is that he moves on. He becomes someone new yes. and returning to an old face. A lot of people didn't like that decision. Um, it sounds like all three of us are in favor of it. But does anybody want to to show some mercy, maybe, you know, give some credence to the idea on the other side or like where they're coming from? Maybe kind of explain that a little bit. Mm. Um, let me uh, let me say two things about this. So one okay. uh, first, first, I want to com to to commend it because it was set up. I mean, this is a whole Tom uh, Baker return. And so I. I'm a I'm also a fan of of <laughs> that classic Doctor Who. I've watched mm -hmm. all of the available episodes. Uh, number four was my Doctor before David Tennant showed up on the on the scene, yeah. and so when um, in, in that interaction with uh, Tom Baker and Matt Smith, uh, as Tom was the uh, the great curator, um, yeah, that was great. The whole idea that you may you're going to revisit some old favorite faces from time to time has been set up. And, oh yeah. And, uh, and so we were, we were all just kind of waiting to see uh, how that would happen again. Um, the, the thing that some fans seem to feel is that um, every time things go a little bit uh, left um, uh, I don't mean that politically. I just mean it just goes into a different <laughs> yeah. direction. Uh, it's bring David Tennant back because David recenters us, and I mean he is the Tom Baker of modern yeah. movies, right? And um, there's such strong feelings. Uh, I I think that the way they handle this character arc, from my part answered some of the concerns of the fan base. Like, are we just, is this a guy going to just keep on uh, <laughs> uh, showing up and then, you know, uh, regenerating and just breaking our hearts <laughs> over and over <laughs> and yeah. over again. Um, I think they, I think they handle it. I, I can understand where, where the concern came from because I had a little bit of that in me as well, even though I thought this was a smart move. But I think they handled it well. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we'll, get, we'll get more to this later. But sometimes, as much as I like the idea that we keep moving forward, we keep changing, sometimes we do need to take a step back and maybe revisit some stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And, and I'm, yeah, again, I'm going to dig in this a little bit deeper later on. But as someone who has had some PTSD, you know, after my accident, there was about a year before my accident that I couldn't get those memories. Like, it was like I couldn't quite access them. And a lot mm -hmm. happened in that year. You know, I was 22. You know, that's one of those years you go through some stuff sometimes. <laughs> and now right. these memories are starting to come back. And it's like, oh, I could keep moving and act like that would never happen. But now that I remember it and I kind of realized I never processed that, like to me, a lot of what they do at the end of this actually spoke to me pretty deeply. So I, I, yes. I actually like that they did that, made the decision. But I do get mm. it. You know, if we keep if we keep going back and we just live in the past, that's also bad. And we don't want to see the doctor live in the past either. Um, I did mm. see a meme that I thought was really funny, though, is that it's the five tenth doctor. <laughs> Here's yeah. the 70th yeah. anniversary special. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I so, love that. If I could just offer a, a response to, to what you just said, there, there, um, there did seem to me to be a kind of, um, of lack of sustainability around the whole modern trajectory of the doctor. So yeah. in the classic, you've got, I mean, the time Lords are everywhere. It's just, it's, but we have been dealing with, and, and I know we'll talk about this as we look at the third special, but the doctor has been dealing with trauma. Yeah. This whole time. Mm -hmm. And the various, the, the, the brief healing moments that have been a part of these last, seasons in the in the modern era um have been brief oh, yeah. because it's almost like the trauma was necessary 
to, to write any story. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and so, you know, the part of that question is like, how long can this go on? Um, yeah. uh, we're just watching different personalities <laughs> process the same trauma. And we know this in our own lives. It can, it can take quite some time. But what does a healing journey look like when you're that many centuries old? Um, another aside, like how old is the doctor again now? <laughs> a billion, maybe. <laughs> um, For including hell bent, uh, a billion. Yeah, who knows? yeah. He said Tennant said a billion. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. Which, hell bent four point five billion. Um, yeah, but it's that's like something, man. 2000 at the last spoken count. So it's, yeah, anyway. Um, but how long, how long are we going to be dealing uh, with this? What does healing look like across those? Yeah. Uh, Which, millennia? To bring it to, to real world. I mean, I'm not going to get too real with this, but guys, look at, look at the Middle East. Um, yeah. Uh, genocide and all the stuff that we see in the Bible that, that does take time to heal. In fact, uh, mm -hmm. What we hear in the next special we're going to talk about, and they ask the doctor how long it's going to take him to heal, and he says a million years, uh, maybe, yeah. Like, I, like I hate to say that, but mm -hmm. genocide isn't something that you take him lightly. And when you feel the responsibility of that, like the doctor does, oh, man. Yes. And I would like to just kind of add this kind of maybe this is too political for me, but yeah, whatever. Um, hey, if we do nothing, you should feel some responsibility for the evil that happens in the world, and mm. maybe that includes genocide sometimes, and um. Yeah, that's a hard thing to take on, and that's why we have Jesus. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I did want to do one thing, one other thing I wanted to mention that I saw, because a lot of my Christian friends have to bring this up in episode one. Do you guys think they push too hard the non-binary stuff? So part of the, the, the thing here, now that the doctor's mm. been a woman, now he's a man again, there's a character in this who is a, a transgender actor who also is a transgender character, and you know, whenever Donna became Donna Doctor way back when, she did binary, binary, binary. So they brought that back up for this. Donna's not supposed to see the doctor's face again. She sees it. She's taking all this in. But since she had a child, the child also bears some of that. So when they're going binary, 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 she's going non-binary, non-binary. Mm -hmm. um, was that too in our face, on the nose, or did that fit? Would it feel forced to you guys? What do you think? Hmm. I, I know who I'm dealing with. And he's been doing this the entire time he's been in control of Doctor Who, so why would he stop now? So you know what I did with yeah. that information when I saw it presented? I disagree, but I know what I'm dealing with, so I'm going to focus on the things that I like. I'm not going to be that yeah. person that has that YouTube video. It's like, Doctor Who's gone woke 2023. And it's like, well, <laughs> well, by that definition, it's been woke since it started. It is what it is. Yeah. I, I don't particularly like it. I think to an extent it makes sense given what he was trying to do with the doctor and Donna being two different beings in a sense. And what we do get later on with 14 and 15 splitting off quite literally from each other. Like, I think that kind of fits. I know what he's going with, but I also know the intent behind what he's going with. So I just shove it to the back of my yeah. mind and move on with my life. I, yeah. I know who I'm dealing with. Yeah, I actually... Uh -huh. At first, I thought, even though I actually do agree with a lot of this stuff, you know, I think transgender issues are very real. You know, I, I think non-binary is just kind of a truth of science, in my opinion. Um, but I still felt like it was a little in our face. Like, they were just kind of throwing that out and, and kind of making it too much about messaging. And like, dude, I'm here to watch an alien with two hearts run around and zap things with a sonic device, you know? <laughs> like, but once you get to episode three, and you kind of see that it's not just law and chaos that like like i think that it's the non-binary stuff is more than just talking about gender here i think this was just kind of some foreshadowing so once i had that third special out of the way i was like oh, okay actually kind of makes sense that they did this and kind of started with this to foreshadow what comes later hey guys christian here to talk about our captivate options that's when you send us a little extra money to just help us along with our projects but what do you get by giving us that extra money, well, you have access to any future online d, &D campaigns. You get extra bonus question content, which we do at least 48 times a month. You can make a one-time donation here of any amount to help support the show. This helps us with our overhead. That includes the editing software that we use, the recording software that we use, the marketing that we have to do for the show, the equipment that we all need to, use to help out with the show, and more. So thank you for what you do. Head out to Captivate. Help us out. We really appreciate what you do. See you later. Yeah. Uh, what do you think, Reverend Justin? You know, I, I uh, had a, um, a a pastor friend who um, who has a 
um, uh, a, a child who is uh, non-binary say, um, this is this is a new version of woke who, and it was not said in a, in a negative way. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, and this person said, and I'm here for it. I'm here for the way that um, there's this intentional uh, nuancing of, of, of language. And so, so yeah, I, um, my <laughs> sense was that, well, let me back up. What I have loved about Doctor Who since Missy, and I'll just tell you, Missy is still my favorite instantiation of the Master. Um, others have been Everybody great. Has it? Yeah. <laughs> I love John Simmons. <laughs> yes. Yes. And but, but Missy, I just thought, oh, this is so good, and in part because of the different places the the character uh, went. But here's the thing. This is the first time we see clearly that regeneration life is, is naturally, normally trans life. It's transformative yeah. uh, and transitioning in every sense uh, of the term. And it's normal. It's normal, yeah. just like, and, and you will remember um, in, in the Bells of St. John's uh, episode where Missy is talking to Clara about uh, her relationship with the doctor, Missy's relationship with the doctor. And, and Missy says, look, our, what we got goes so far beyond the way y'all are y'all deal with uh, y'all sexualize things and how you deal with gender so what so it was almost like this this uh hey he, we time uh lords and time ladies time people are going to show y'all how to how to think on these things in an elevated level and i liked that i liked the normalizing of it you don't have to uh, focus too much on it because this is just life. Y'all catch up to what this this time lord life is. Mm -hmm. We are in our particularly in progressive uh, spaces. We are, you know, constantly uh, reinventing, adjusting our language in order to help adjust our sensibilities. Yeah. Um, and, and so, and it's, it's a good journey, but sometimes it feels like we're between haircuts. It's like, we're still, it's still coming into being. And I, what I liked about this time Lord society is let's show you a society where we take, this is so normal. This way of life is so normal. We completely take it for granted. And maybe that helps you to learn how to take it for granted in a positive way and uh, not in a negative way, the positive sense of taking something for granted as well. Um, and this, it, it was quite on the nose um, oh, yeah. for me. And it, and it felt as far as time Lord talk, um, yeah. maybe like a, a step back, even though I embrace everything um, yeah. that we're doing, just, it felt like a, a, a step back in some way. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm a, I don't want to spend all of our time on this. So I'm going to, I, I will say, I think one of the advantages of Doctor Who and all, all sci-fi has this advantage of opening our minds to what if, what if this is the case. So even if you don't believe any of this, when you're doing sci-fi, you should be able to put on your what if cap and kind of look through the lens of mm -hmm. someone else. Um, and, and what I think is fun though, because even in our world, we know there are certain creatures that have both genders and there's no way to just deny that they have literally mm -hmm. both anatomies attached to them. So we know that that is a thing that exists within biology. So even if you want to take the conservative approach that that's not true with humans, you can still put your mind in the place of this is true of Time Lords. Mm -hmm. um, and for those of us who do want to put it, you know, with humans, it's like, okay, this can actually help us explore a lot. What does it look like? Because Time Lords are very human-like. Mm -hmm. so, so I think it allows both to have rooms to kind of expand our horizons and challenge ourselves. The thing I didn't like, though, 
was when the non-binary character basically told the doctor he couldn't understand because a male presenting doctor couldn't understand. Not that I disagree with males can't understand things a female, but we're talking about a species who's literally been both genders. I, I feel like you're, you might be pushing it a little bit because it seems like they don't have the same relationship to gender that we have, like you were discussing. So I'm like, I feel like you, yeah, that, that felt a little off to me. But other than that, sure. Why not? Well, it felt off to me because, again, after that many uh, thousand or <laughs> maybe a billion years of of time lord uh, life, I mean, particularly as we think about this timeless yeah. child uh, bit. Now, gr granted, there's been some forgetting in there, but it if the hope, <laughs> the hope of progression is that if you've been both female and male you've you've lived this non-binary life that it would teach you something such that no matter what instantiation of the doctor you carry that wisdom because I, what i what i don't want is for a male presenting doctor to have lost what they learned when they were a yeah. female presenting doctor. Yeah. I don't want that. That's regressive. Yeah. Um, I think it would have been a lot more interesting for the doctor to be making a lot of references to, well, when I was a woman, I actually, you know, like that would have been a lot more yeah. interesting. Yeah. But yeah. So right. it just, yeah, that's, it's, it's the, <laughs> the, the non-regressive is hopeful to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I agree. I agree. Um, Christian, did you have anything else to add? <laughs> I know we're, we're a little bit more on the progressive yeah. end of this, both me and uh, Justin. So I didn't want to leave you out before moving yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was actually surprised that Rose didn't end up becoming a companion for, for me too. At this like, I thought he would just like, kind thought, of tag along. Yeah, I thought but they she, were setting Rose up for that, but uh, they do go to Mars. Which, uh, yeah, that is true <laughs> off screen, but it did happen. So, yeah. but Donna is my, my favorite companion that isn't named Ace. And so I was happy to get the Donna back. Like I thought her story done and over. And what this special showed is that, Hey, there's a way past that inevitability. Look, there's no way you can go back and see Donna ever yeah. again. There's no hope. Look, there is oh. hope. You just gotta be screwy with how things work. And that's what Dr. Who does really well. And I love yeah. seeing the doctor do that yeah. in this. And anyone who's a fan of the 60 year long series and has seen a substantial part of it has some bad hot takes. My, bad opinion for this episode is that Donna Noble is my least favorite of the Doctor Who companion. <laughs> She's so annoying to me. But I, I, I liked her more in this. I will never understand. Better. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that first episode, the Doctor comes back. He has a familiar face. He's trying to figure out why do I have this face again? Boom. He sees Donna, who he's not supposed to see, because if she saw the Doctor again, you know, he caged off part of her mind, and it could open things up, cause a lot of trauma, cause her to just break, because she's seen inside the Doctor's brain, and humans can't handle all that um sci-fi stuff happens he solves the sci-fi stuff donna ends up having to have that wall broken down she starts having that meltdown but then her child also experiences it and kind of pulls a guardians of the galaxy one where they share the the burden and that causes them to live somehow and then we get to wild blue yonder happens next because uh donna noble goes into the tardis for a brief moment and spills coffee on the console and boom they show up <laughs> They see Sir Isaac Newton change gravity to mavity. Don't worry about it. And, then, and I love how so far they really just don't worry about it. Butterfly effect, be damned. We're just not going to revisit that. Gravity is now called mavity. It's fine. They suddenly show up in a really interesting spaceship. Um, Man, Wild Blue Yonder, this was, the first one was like, oh, this is what Doctor Who's supposed to be. This one was, oh my God. David T. Russell's just makes the best TV ever. Like, I was so blown away. I've seen this more times than I can count. It's already something that I just have on in the background while I'm doing other things. I I love this. This might be one of my favorite Doctor Who episodes. Um, without completely yielding to recency bias uh, this might be a 10 out of 10 even. I just, I loved this episode. Like, my first reaction was, oh my God. I was like, I gotta watch it again because I, I think I must just been in a mood. So let me sleep the next day, see it again. There's no way it was that good. Oh my God. And then the next day I was like, oh, <laughs> yep, nope, it's just that good. <laughs> Christian, I'll let, you, I'll let you start this time. What was your first reaction to Wild Blue Yonder? How could he pick the wrong Donna? No, it was, it was that moment of, <laughs> this is a really fun exploration, kind of in a midnight sense from an older, mm -hmm. well, from Tenet's run of, 
hey, this thing you don't understand, or like, uh, what was that Star Trek Voyager episode where those interdimensional beings end up in the holodeck and they think that this is what reality actually is. So Voyager yes. crew has to do something about that. Uh, or even you can go further back to, you know, Lovecraftian ideas of these things you can't comprehend. How do they interact with the human being? And they play it really well here because we have, you know, don't blink. Now we have don't think. And mm. That's done extremely well here. It's fun to see the shenanigans that go on when they keep getting split up. And like you would think after all the time they've known each other, they would know each other a lot better, but they're only human or time Lord in this situation <laughs> and they still screw up. It's so much fun. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Man. Wow. This is like a, it's like a, a black box theater, two person play, you know, yeah. where it's just, yeah. in, so you go to those and it's got to be good. I mean, if you get two people, you know, on a stage <laughs> in a, in a, in a minimalist set. And, and so they, they managed to, on a, on a spaceship, they managed for me to capture the feel of that minimalist set with two folks doing some great acting uh -huh. with oh, a yeah. great storyline. And so it did feel like top notch. Doctor Who. I mean, this is this yeah. is solid classic Doctor Who, yeah. Doctor Who that we love. And they did so much with when you think about it, so little. Um, oh, yeah. A, as they are um, because because the the nemesis <laughs> in a certain way <laughs> is themselves. <laughs> you know, they are their own, yeah. uh, you know, uh, uh, nemesis. And it was oh, oh, man. So brilliantly done. I love that episode, man. Honestly, I got chills when David Tennant's doctor, like, the, sorry, the 14th doctor had that little mental breakdown in the hallway. I literally had chills. I was like, oh, mm -hmm. I, I know what that is. Like, yes. and, and some of this, I feel like if you haven't had some of this kind of trauma in your life, I, I wonder if it sits as well, mm -hmm. you know, but I feel like at our age, probably a lot of us have had some kind of trauma and you're like, yeah. oh, no, that's. Yeah, I know what he's feeling, and you're just like, oh, man. Um, okay, Christian, uh, real quick, how would you summarize Wild Blue Yonder? What happens in this episode? Uh, so after the coffee mishap and meeting Sir Isaac Newton and destroying the word gravity and all of history, the Doctor and Donna end up on this spaceship that is seemingly at like the edges of our known universe, uh, and they're figuring out, okay, where is the crew? Why is there only a robot here? Oh, no, what are these strange beings that have now taken on our appearance, but they can not keep their hands straight or their fingers are too long and they're just repeating stuff back out of this. Like what's happening here? They get separated from each other, like uh, Donna learning more about where the doctor is actually from, from that. Well, actually, no, does she actually learn? Is it, it's that sense of yes, where he was born. It was Gallifrey was her answer. And that wasn't right. Or was it him? Sorry, that messed up my head. Every time they switch perceptions, like, which one's the real one? Which one's the fake one? <laughs> so if I get anything oh, wrong, man. that's why that and my memory's dying as I get older. And eventually <laughs> they get to the point where they just have to flee the ship because they cannot let these beings get into regular space because they just think that we, uh, our emotions are too much for them to handle. They think that this uh, we're irrational beings. We should all die and all that. So they're going to get out the heck out of the ship blow it up so they can't follow him. Doctor picks the wrong Donna, realizes his mistake, thankfully, with a couple seconds to spare, puts the other one back on, yeah. takes the real one, they escape. Man, yeah. Some of the yeah. stuff I love with this, though. But, uh, hey, I gotta stop with the ma the Mavity thing. Like, the fact that they just changed the word gravity to Mavity was genius. The <laughs> amount of memes and stuff I see on Facebook of, you know, like, the, the play of um, <laughs> perhaps I'll try to find Mavity. <laughs> You know, the, 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 the movie, the gravity changed the poster now says Mavity on it. And I'm like, I, I love it. I love that they did this. They just randomly gifted us this inside joke and I love it. Um, outside of that, you know, the, the, so many times you see these shapeshifter things and it's like, oh no, I know it was the real you because I know you better than anyone else. The fact that they went out of their way to not have that, to be like, actually that doesn't make sense. It doesn't matter how well you know you, if the shapeshifters thing is to take on your memories, you're going to be indistinct, like you're not going to be able to make a distinguish scene, you know, mm -hmm. at some point. And it's like, I, I love that they went that they didn't go with some kind of loophole. Oh, no, only Donna knew this about the doctor. Like, I'm so glad they didn't take the easy way out with that. Um, well, and it, this was good. This was good Doctor Who 
thriller here you know oh yeah i mean uh, like blink you know it's just this so good uh, you it's like this this is scary um yeah and um and and you could have probably even gone a little bit further and even made it scarier (laughs) and 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 what's so scary is these folks are downloading your life and at a certain point you (laughs) won't be able to tell they can do everything that you can do and without but without your sense of I mean, but they're bent on destroying. So, so without your yeah. sense of care for life and preservation, these are some of the most dangerous creatures out there, which is why they've got to hang out at the edge of space where not even the doctor has been that far because of what they potentially could do to oh, yeah. in reality. Well, and that's, that's and another thing I like. One is... of the doctor's greatest strengths against them, which is his brain. <laughs> As a whole so scene, like in think. a normal episode, this would if be that think. moment. Oh, I figured it out. But no, figuring things out is the bad yeah. thing to do. Yes. <laughs> yeah, because they could feel your thoughts. They're downloading your thoughts. And it's, uh, I love that the captain of the ship that was there before, even though you don't meet them, that character is incredible. They figured out if things go slow enough, if they just kill themselves, they can end what's happening here. And then the doctor comes in the situation afterwards and almost messes it up because he's too smart for his own good. Yeah. I love uh-huh. that. Even... I think there's even a sense of the non-binary stuff in here, but instead of it being like the last time, so at the edge of the universe, there's literally nothing, which the doctor is explaining that humans just don't have the capacity to understand what nothing is yet. And I, I loved that, even though it was a little bit uh, mm. condescending, I still was like, no, actually, I like that explanation that humans just can't get nothing, because I think that's probably true. Part it's of like uh, why we have so many debates around what it means if God created Ex Nilo or not, um, that, you know, inside Christianese, but. It's mm-hmm. interesting. I think that is part of why we have those debates is we just can't understand what nothing is. And then the non-binary thing, though, is I, I don't think these creatures, they were called not things. Mm-hmm. They were shapeshifters, all the stuff. They were trying to become things. And what they were going to become is the first thing that they're able to mimic. So they're not things trying to become things. And what does it mean to be a being that doesn't have being? That's fascinating. And, and the reason I'll say it's non-binary, I don't think they were good or evil. I think they're outside of our realm of moral ideas. Mm -hmm. And what they saw was who we are were things that destroy. So if they're going to be being, Mm -hmm. well, the beings of our universe are genocidal maniacs. So that must be what it means to be. And I think it really brings up this question of morality and what does it mean to just exist? What is existence? And that's why we have a reverend on the show. Justin, what is existence? (laughs) Well, <laughs> some of them I'll go there, but I'm gonna I'm gonna turn I want to turn back to you, what you were saying about this. There, uh, in so many ways, they are they are non-binary, um, but they they don't have um, they are uh, completely. Um, I don't know. I want to say they're. They're agnostic about everything, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, yeah. And so the, but what it, or indiscriminate, that's what I actually want to say. I want to say yeah, it's, yeah. it's indiscriminate. And it's indiscriminate in a way like um, zombieism is, yeah. right? It's this constant consumption that has no end. I mean, it's not, we're not, attaching anything moral to it but that's the i mean this is the kind of the social critique of 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 of, of zombieism is a is a social critique of of um uh, you know what it means to consume in an indiscriminate way so they're like these it's a different kind of zombie yeah is 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 what they are and you know what's dangerous is there's just there would be no <laughs> potentially no end to their consumption yeah. um yeah. again like you say it's not necessarily that they're trying to be um malicious or that they're trying to achieve some good it's just that they're consuming um yeah, mm. yeah. and also this is just is not really relevant to the like morality questions or anything around this but i just gotta say mm-hmm. the way that they moved and sometimes they they kind of like change their bodies to be able to move faster very much reminded me of the uh, the newer it movies and the way mm. they have the um that being move i was like oh yeah it was it was creepy <laughs> um sorry uh christian 
uh, let's go to you. If we're thinking of this like non-discriminatory, just destroying this evil, not evil, or what does it mean to just be? What is existence? Is existence consumption? Is existence good or evil? Can you exist in our world without being what the not things observed from our universe? Mm. Uh, you give me an hour, I can type you a 10 and a half page paper on that. Uh, <laughs> but for right and now, everybody will proceed. The rest of the video is us watching Christian type. <laughs> no, well, you gave me a difficult question to answer. I'll do my best. And I'm sure there'll be flaws in what I say. So feel free to pick it apart, pick it to pieces. Existence is being. It is the act of being alive, whether that state is I am at my present right now or I'm my glorified state later on. It is the ability to think for myself, not being controlled by another being, having my own thoughts, way to express it, and then enacting that will upon the world, whether that, once again, be this present world or where we end up later on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that actually it gets to um, God creating humans with free will and all that kind of stuff. And I think it gets to why these are not things and why I don't think of them as evil, because they weren't really thinking for themselves. They were downloading how David Tennant thought. They were downloading how our universe thought, how we felt, what we did. They weren't coming up with that in of themselves, which is why they were not things. They were beings that weren't beings. And I think the reason that we could say we are, they, you know, I think, therefore I am. You know, that whole statement is, you know, cliche, whatever, but I think that's because that's how God made us. God made us with free will, and that is how we define existence. I, that That's how I would put it. Um, Justin, does all that sound good? Did I accidentally say any heresies or anything there? No, I don't think there's anything heretical there. I mean, it really is this, this um, I, I'm trying to think through their whole sense of, of, of agency and free will, because there did seem to be, uh, a part of their existence that was predetermined. And again, that's, I'm just, I'm trying to figure out how to name that. I mean, they're, they are hardwired to consume. So they were nothing when starved of everything. That's what the first pilot of the ship tried to do in, in, you know, jettisoning themselves from the, from the airlock because it, removed these it put these mm -hmm. beings in a state of complete neutrality but when but when they are um and so they don't seem to have any agency at, in that moment when they're neutral but when in proximity to others that do have agency there mm -hmm. is this it's almost predetermined that they these beings they're only hardwired to do one thing that is to consume. And so, yes, they're going to take on the, the, um, the personalities or things like that of, 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 yeah. of what they consume, but they will consume, um, hardwired for it. Which man, see, see now that just leads me to, and I, I don't want to spend all of our time here, but, I think this is actually an important discussion because it's not just an abstract thing of what does it mean to exist, but even when I'm thinking like practically, I, I think when I'm doing the things where I am, you know, I'm around certain people, so I'm behaving a certain way, they're the political party, so I just kind of form my beliefs around them, form myself around other people. I think I'm actually taking some of my own agency, some of my own being away from myself. I'm living, maybe if we're going to use biblical terms, I'm living with like a yoke, I'm living in slavery. And I think part of what it means to really trust God, to trust Jesus, to live in Christ is to let God kind of take that bondage where you feel like you have to mimic those around you away and that you can go back to true agency, being your true self in Jesus, not just, you know, a puppet that's doing what the Bible says, not just a puppet that's mimicking what's around you, but truly your true self. As, yes. um, I know I kind of probably sound like C.S. Lewis, but <laughs> actually I was thinking about it, like, I think I might have just accidentally stole someone else's thoughts. <laughs> oh no, where's my agency? <laughs> <laughs> well, what's, it's, it's Stanley Harwas once said that when you think you've had ori an original thought, it just means you forgot where you first heard it. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> <laughs> Which ironic to think about when we're talking about agency and what does it mean to exist and not just being like those around you. Yeah, right. <laughs> but uh, I still think it's a valid thing. I think it's a valid thing. If you find yourself needing to be like those around you, maybe you're starting to lose some of your own agency and, um, that's where I turn to God, but you know, I also think there's therapy and different stuff for that. And um, I think it's important to 
your own well-being, your own health, that you stay true to your own agency and not mm -hmm. become a not thing and walk around like it. Um, <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, let's let's move on to the last one here. So during Wild Blue Yonder, David Tennant plays a game. He he invokes superstition. He tells them, you know, all kind of vampire and stuff. They have to count salt before they can pass it. So he poured a line of salt out, and he at the end of the episode is like, oh, maybe I shouldn't have played a game at the edge of the universe. That could be bad. I was like, ah, never mind. I won't think about it. Uh, then we come to the giggle. Um, Reverend Justin, you want to mm. what? What happens in the giggle before we do first reactions? Because I don't, I can't give my reactions without spoiling things. Go ahead and spoil it for everybody. What happens in this last of the three David Tennant specials of 2023? Well, this is a great um, way to bring back an early character from classic Doctor Who. We're talking going straight oh, yeah. back to the first Doctor Peter Peter Hartnell um, and the Toy Maker, this celestial being of. Yeah. Uh, seemingly infinite power uh, cannot classically die, but if the toy maker has an Achilles heel, it is that the toy maker is bound by the rules of the game. So you got this, you know, infinite power, but you are bound by the rules of the game. And in classic Who, um, the uh, um, doctor outwits the toy maker, uh -huh. and uh, and when his niece uh, says, "All right, we beat him," uh, he says, "Well, this you can't kill this one, and uh, and I'm going to see him again in time." Well, yes. so here we go. Here we go. We're oh, yeah. we're back in and. Um, uh, uh, so David uh, Tennant's doctor and 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 uh, and Donna Noble uh, get back to Earth um, and everything is in disarray. Uh, we <laughs> have this beautiful moment where the doctor is uh, reunited with Donna's grandfather, which is a very sweet uh, moment. Oh yeah. And then the rest of the time is okay. So how are we going to? Uh, what's going on in this world in this chaos that the celestial toy maker has created because what the toy maker has done to uh, society um, as he's encrypted himself into the first television broadcast, <laughs> uh, which is like a sneaky way of entering into <laughs> our reality again in a very creepy oh. way of doing so uh, as well. But so now everybody um, has to win. Like, so this is this part of the celestial toy maker's nature is being imbued into the, the world where everybody is, uh, that's all they care about. <laughs> and so it's causing havoc. So it's, it's, it's again, you know, what we see in these episodes of Doctor Who is them meditating on an aspect of human nature that if taken too, too far uh, can be harmful. Uh, yeah. And so uh, and so the toy maker is playing around with, with our reality. And so then the doctor must, again, find a way to outwit this toy maker uh, and in, uh, in, a, in a game or a, a, what turns out to be a series of uh, games. Um, oh, man. Because again, the toy maker is bound by uh, the rules of the game. And what higher rule of a game than you have than the best of three? <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. Ah, oh, man. I did love that. Um, yeah, we're, we're going we're gonna to get to the end later, I think. But just, just with the premise of like what happens here, this, from my understanding, the first time you see the toy maker, way back when, the doctor actually falls outside of reality. So that's yeah. where the toy maker lives. He lives outside of our universe, outside of reality. And that's where he's not, you know, he's not chaos. He's not lawful. He's just play, which is its own mm -hmm. thing that's separate from these other things. D&D, &D, beware. Um, but y you have that. The, the next time I think he sees them in a pocket dimension in an audio book that I mentioned on our last What's New episode. Um, this is the first time the toy maker is in our world. And uh, yeah, I have 
I have mixed feelings on it. I don't love it as much as Wild Blue Yonder. I love Neil Patrick Harris. I think it was perfect casting. I loved a lot of what happened. I actually really love the messaging here. You know, he talks about how everyone has to be right now. You see them tweeting and saying, you know, different stuff and canceling people and all these things. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that actually just is our reality. <laughs> like, oh, that's that is 2023. Um, so you, you see that being just what it is, man, it, it was it was incredibly done. Awesome stuff. The only thing I didn't like is how the toy maker loses in the end. Because truly, it was just random chance. The doctor didn't outsmart him or anything. He won a game of catch because some random phenomena happens that's not supposed to happen that gave him a biological advantage. And it's like, uh, okay. <laughs> that was disappointing. The rest of it, I absolutely loved. So the, I would have given the last one 10 out of 10. This one, I would have given 9 out of 10. But because all the characters and everything was so well done, the scenes were shot so beautifully. Even the CGI was done so just incredible. The giant Neil Patrick Harris with the puppet of David Tennant kind of running around. I was like, oh, man, <laughs> it looked cool. It was great. Um, I'd still give it probably like a nine and a, or a half out of ten, maybe a nine out of ten. Um, it's just it's not as great as Wild Blue Yonder to me personally. Yeah. But, man, the characterizations and everything, fantastic. Um, yeah. Christian, what was your first react? Oh, yeah. No, go ahead. Ahead. yeah. Christian, go, go. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this entire episode was a personal attack against me. Uh, I love winning. I love being right. And how dare you ever make me the villain? <laughs> how dare I live in a world where dummy for theology exists and there's never an answer at the end of any episode? Why do I listen to this drivel? No, uh, this was perfect for me. Not like a perfect as in like 10 out of 10, but like I loved experiencing this episode, seeing uh like Neil Patrick Harris was on fire yeah. as the toy yeah. maker, like switching from I've these fake accents so to fake accents, just to screw with people and screwing over uh, uh, 14 with like making fun of all the companions he lost along the way. What a more villainous thing can you do to bring up that trauma, yeah. which does get yeah. addressed near the end very well. And we'll get to that when we get to that, because I think you want to save that for else. Um, yeah. Then I agree somewhat with like, a, oh, it's a random chance, but it's also a game. And games yeah. are affected by random chance. It'd be like if he rolled the dice. Well, maybe it's a 50-50 shot. Maybe some statistician can come and tell me that there's actually a 51 to 49% chance or whatever. It's <laughs> it's up to yeah. random chance. Like, it doesn't matter if I roll a six and playing Trivial Pursuit or whatever, or whatever game I'm playing. That means I get to go before somebody does a five or a four. It's random chance. It's a game. So I understand, but yeah. I, it wasn't as big of a deal for me. Oh, yeah, no, I understood it. I actually think that, I kind of like some of what they do because I, I think the reason it was done the way it was is because they Russell T. Davies didn't fall for the trap of making this the 60th anniversary where everything ends perfectly and it's awesome and it rings and it stands on its own. Instead, he said, no, this is part of a TV series and it's supposed to set other things up. And I think it set other things up beautifully. Um, yes. Justin, what was your first reaction? Well, I so um, just all of the above. Everything you all have said, I... I um, want to, to, to echo, I, this was a great episode. I too thought the ending, you know, um, I, I was waiting for something to be very, very clever, but I think it was very clever to go to the first game, you know, this basic uh, game. I did like that very much. I, I do want to just point out something that I really appreciated. As you noted, this is setting up some other, um, other episodes, but oh, yeah. it was the the sub? It's not even a subplot. It's just a bit of information uh, about the master. Yes, yeah. Ma the master being trapped in the toy maker's golden tooth. Now, here's the thing about yeah. I, I just so this was so classic Doctor Who. I mean, this goes back to <laughs> even oh, yeah. even classic Doctor Who more than our modern gener generation. The doc the master is a master of not dying. So the doctor might be the timeless <laughs> child, but by gosh, the master will find a way not to die. And what, and what I liked about that detail was the, the toy maker actually thought the toy maker defeated the master. This is, this is the classic master move. I'm going to pretend to die or be trapped so that I won't die. <laughs> Celestial Toymaker didn't understand is the master actually won. Yeah, Just before the master's, the master's death, <laughs> a game is played that actually preserves the master 
that's going to give the master a new yeah. lease on life. I mean, Which, and then a female hand picking up the tooth at the end. I, yes. they, I know they want Another us to think back. it's Missy. I don't know if it is, but I know they want us to think that. Well, but this was, but this was also in the John Sims. I think it was. The, oh yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, remember yeah. when when his when watch, the master I mean. died uh, another time? <laughs> there was the yeah. essence of the master in, uh, in in ensconced somehow in that yeah. ring. So this, and we saw that ring pip, picked up, and that's how the master was oh, yeah. alive. And that's like our the tooth was picked up. That's like our Batman Joker moment. But then there's an even, for me, an even greater, not throwaway line, but a line that I'm like, ah, that's going to stick in my head for a while, where the, even the toy maker from outside of reality, greater than our reality, says, there's one. Even, he played a game with God in one, but there's one in your universe I wouldn't dare play a game with. Wait a minute, what? Yeah. <laughs> Hold up, who? It's not the master. It's not God. Yeah. Ooh, <laughs> like, what do you mean? Yes. Uh, that's gonna haunt me. I'm gonna well, wake up in the middle of the night thinking about who would he not play a game? <laughs> and that's someone else's game to play. Screen. He says, which oh, makes man. you think it's uh, it's our our fifteenth doctor, perhaps. Oh, man, um, yeah. And of course, you know, bringing stuff from outside this reality into our reality, all this other stuff, having non-binary where it's not just lawful and chaos. Now there's play and who knows what else. In the next episode, it's gonna have goblins. Yeah, Russell D. Davies, when he says, uh, we're going to start including some fantasy, he wasn't kidding. He said there was going to be a surprise. He wasn't kidding. Christian, can you please tell him what the surprise twist at the end of this episode was? Let's go ahead. Let's jump into this chaotic, yeah. crazy, sorry, not chaos, playful twist. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a big moment where the toy maker is on a giant gun of some sort on the unit building, threatening to kill the doctor. And in any other episode, the plot armor would be on. But since we have to transition to the newest Doctor, 14 bites it. Like, straight. It takes a beam right through his body. But with everything that's been going on with this specific regeneration, with his relationship to the Doctor Donna, Man. Yeah. and all this funky, special Whovian weirdness, instead of regenerating, he stays but also regenerates at a later point in time <laughs> to the point where there are two doctors who split from one being that have to literally be pulled apart by generation, baby. To happen. <laughs> and we are introduced to 15 and I looked up his name to practice pronunciation and I oh, have good. completely forgotten it. It's like, <laughs> man, Christian, uh, uh, I was counting on you. Shooty, I think. God, guy. <laughs> I'm sorry if I, I screwed the 15th it up, which I know I did. Forgive me, 15, mm. who has this brand new amount of charisma himself. Like, incredible. Uh, seems, yeah, there's obvious, there's been enough time to where he has gotten over a lot of stuff and just carries himself in a different way. And the two of them join forces to defeat the toy maker in a game of catch. Oh, and yeah, at this point yeah. in time, 14, in order to deal with the trauma of everything from even beyond the time war. Uh, to the time war to learning about his supposed true origins, whatever, and all that mess <laughs> is going to just stay with Donna's family as like an older brother, older uncle kind of figure, just to relax for once in his goddamn yeah, life. It's his own TARDIS. <laughs> yeah. And 15 oh, then goes off to his own adventures, yeah, setting up I, what's going to be happening when 15 comes in, which I am super hyped oh, for. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I didn't know I could be hyped for a new Doctor again. Like, I just didn't know it was possible, and they did it. I'm excited for him. I loved his scenes in this. And not only that, they went from me being like, oh, Disney's trying to make money. I was aggravated because, you know, they're going to start with, we're going to start all over with season one again. And I'm like, oh, great. Here we go again. Soft reboot. <laughs> and then I saw this, and I'm like, oh, the Doctor has to actually go heal. And the 15th Doctor is yes. what happens post-healing. We're out yes. of the traumatic era, if we're going to go with our Taylor Swift terms. We're out of our trauma era. And we're into our healing era. And this Doctor, somehow, they caught it on scene perfectly. You know, David Tennant, you could tell that the 14th Doctor, he's he's losing weight. They even mention it, that he's losing weight. He looks just traumatized, hurt. You could tell how he speaks. His little fits. You're like, that's someone who experienced trauma. And as someone who's experienced trauma, I'm like, I see it. And then as soon as 15 shows up, you're like, oh, that's that's what healing looks like. It's like, man, that's it was beautiful, beautiful. I was like, that's what healing looks like. Oh my gosh. And for the 14th Doctor to see what it looks like and then to be able to have the freedom to go pursue healing, oh, 
that honestly i'll uh, sorry i'm trying not to like tear up i'm like i man it spoke to me in so many levels it's like you have to sometimes go revisit things take that time and just heal um right. justin i'd love to hear from you on this well so here's <laughs> i'm gonna do a little theology uh, here as well so the greek word for salvation uh is sozo right and so we translate it as salvation all the time, but it means wholeness, wholeness in spirit, wholeness in mind, body, soul. Mm -hmm. It means um, it's, it's got this connotation of a complete healing for mind, body, spirit. That is salvation, right? So, so I like to talk about healing as, as a part of salvation, I mean, uh, it's in the word. It's in this more complete, nuanced definition uh, than we often give it. And so, this healing, uh, restorative is not just a regenerative process. It's been this restorative process yeah. that's going on here with the doctor, and it's beautiful. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't. I, <laughs> I struggle to imagine how you could create. Um, it's not just a restart for the series. I mean, I know it gets to do that, yeah. but it's like this new lease on life, yeah. um, which deeply honors the past, uh, does not overlook or negate any of the trauma uh, that was there. It is real. And I love this whole idea of, like we're time lords, we heal out of you know. I mean, out just order, like, move back and forth in time. We <laughs> yeah. we 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 healing out of order, you know. Yeah. But um, but I love I love that. Uh, awesome. I thought it was very sweet, and that that that, that uh, and and nothing was taken away from the fourteenth doctor. Yeah, you've I'm got right. your people. You've got your TARDIS. Um, and you can still travel about, but you don't feel the need to all the time. You don't need you, the weight yeah. of the, the weight of the universe isn't on your shoulders. And, um, you know, like this whole, you've heard it said, you know, hurt people, hurt people, uh, heal yeah. people, heal people. It's like, you know, the doctor in, in, in 15 is still gonna move throughout the, the universe uh, working, doing all the same work. What's that going to look like? Yeah, I'm so someone excited. who has has healed and can go about it with a different spirit. Oh, yes, man, my gosh, yeah. come yeah. on! And we we so got to sit in the salvation stuff. And another part of what I like in the Greek, a lot of times when salvation comes up in your New Testament, it, it's weird because we don't have the same verb tenses in English. But it's something that happened, but is still happening. And that's something that I love because you see this here where David Tennant gets to go heal, but he's still healing. And it's like, ah, oh, man, man. And then you you have this two sides. Like you have the one side of, man, this was just great writing, right? Like as far as like story goes, because this feels complete. It feels like he gets to heal. This feels complete. It feels good. But also you have the, the hey, if you hate the timeless child, guess what? Now you can write it off with that one line where the toy maker said, I was just playing jigsaw with your past. <laughs> Um, if you wish your doctor was still around, guess what? He might be by generations a thing, apparently. So it's like th they they did all these little things that are like, okay, we have the cheap cut arounds, but that wasn't even the point. The point was the healing, was the story, and that the story was beautiful. Um, Christian, do you have anything you wanted to add to this conversation? It, this is kind of like the perfect way that I've ever seen on television or anywhere else to have your cake and eat it too. When it comes to like, you know, when we, we started <laughs> early about, was it, was it a cash grab or like a fan service just to have David Tennant show up again in the form of the 14th doctor? Well, if it wasn't written as well as this was, yeah, I would feel like it was a cash grab. I would feel like it's, oh, I need people interested in Dr. Who again. We're going to bring David Tennant back. Who's our number one guy who pretty much ev not everyone's most people's doctor when they considered the <laughs> new series, yeah. like he is mine. No, you get to have, your cake and eat it too. David Tennant is back. Yeah, he's still out there. And whenever we want to, we can bring 14 back and tell stories that aren't beholden to the 10th Doctor's time. Yeah. 
Whoever does Doctor Who comics, because, get on that yeah. Mars with uh, with Rose. Yeah. <laughs> I need to see it. Like we that can happen at any point in time and make sense and not just be fan service. That yeah, and not to say this isn't fan service because it is, but it's done so well that I don't Brilliant. care. Yeah, and that's where mm. I want to speak to the Doctor Who community. If anyone's just on YouTube and watching random Doctor Who things and sat through an hour and ten minutes of this. You can absolutely focus on the parts of was it fan service? Should the doctor be able to just move on? Should we not revisit? You could sit on that stuff. You could sit on, oh, were they just trying to write off the timeless child with a jigsaw puzzle line? You could, whatever. You could focus on those things. But I, I urge everyone, please focus on the fact that this show gave us all permission, permission to heal, permission to realize our trauma, to not just ignore it and move forward, but to realize it and to heal. And even if you're not Christian, I think some form of salvation is possible when we're talking about salvation being this healing process that I think everybody needs. So mm. that's the one thing I took from this. I, I think it gave us permission to heal, and it's something that everybody does need. So please take the permission. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Amen. All right. We have anything else? Sorry. Sorry. I'm uh, sorry we got so deep on this, but man, like that's what the show does. It's sci fi. It's silly. It's wacky. It's not beings that are really existing and, and you know, something called the meat that's cute and cuddly, but also a chaos monster that wants to eat you. It's the, it's, you know, Neil Patrick Harris coming back, threatening reality and losing a ball of a game of catch. But it's also deep hurt, realizing trauma and finding healing. And um, that's that's why I love this show, because it can be silly. It can be play. It can be chaos and it can give us permission to heal. And I love that. <sighs> All right. Anything else to add, guys? No, we're going to jump man. to our recommendations then as we start to wrap this one up. <laughs> All right. Uh, for our recommendations on our What's News, we pick one. So if someone hasn't seen Doctor Who yet, which of these three? If they were going to use one of these three as their first episode. Or I'll, I'll give you the option of saying none of these and pick another one. But if you think any of these would be a good first episode, you know, let's let's lift it up. I, I know I, I also said it was my favorite episode, but I truly think you could watch Wild Blue Yonder and not know a ton about the show. And uh, what you don't know, they kind of explain for you. So I think it's a good episode in of itself to watch, just like Blink. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <clears throat> No, I'm I'm with you there. I mean, it's um, figuring out how to onboard people to Doctor Who is always a bit of a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I've tried several different things. Often, I will say, like, S -s -s watch Blink. Yeah, it's, and then we'll figure yeah. out the rest um, <laughs> because it's going to yeah. be going to be so good. And I and I agree with you about uh, Wild Blue Yonder. I think it is good. It's just solid Doctor Who writing beginning to end. Um, oh, yeah. One thing, oh, man, I, I hate to do this, but <laughs> real quick side note. One thing, Russell D. Davies talks about like bringing gods and mythical things back into the fold. And uh, I've heard mention. So my very first episode of Doctor Who was The Pit with maybe Satan. But I hear yeah. that creature might make an appearance again. And that would be so Ooh. cool. I'd love that. Uh, see, because it's, you know, your first episode, you always have attachments to all of that kind of stuff. You know, so David Tennant, Satan. I love all the. Sorry, uh, mm. Christian. Christian, what's your uh, one of these uh, three? It had to be someone's first. If one of these had to be the first one, I I mean, you can't go wrong with the first one with the Star Beast. There's enough there. Like there are gonna be some proper nouns you're not gonna understand, but fourteen is new. Is an old companion. You're gonna learn enough about what you need to know about Donna there for everything to make sense. Wild Blue Honor is not a bad one, but if I had to go beyond this, I might choose Dalek for Eccleston's run. Where you That's get his hatred of the Daleks and like their enmity between each other with just one Dalek and one Doctor, that might be where I go. Oh, that is also a good one. Oh, man. Well, guys, if you haven't seen Doctor Who, get into it. See all the silly sci fi craziness. Learn about the trauma. Sit in healing. And of course, while you're doing all that, you could go over to Spotify or Apple Podcasts, wherever you're at, leave a rating, review. If you're on YouTube, smash that like button, all the good stuff. Um, also, Podchaser, that helps us a lot. If you go over to Podchaser, leave us a review over there. And we need you all to do one extremely important thing for us, and that's to remember, we're all a chosen people, a geekdom of priests.
Did you know Systematic Ecology has a YouTube channel? Now you do. And while you're there, you can see exclusive stuff like our comic book catch-up series, Manga Mustard, Drinks with Tejas, the companion series to our annual theme. You can go Friday Night Frights with me where I go through cryptozoology, ufology, and more. You can also go to see Spidey Swing Buys where I'm doing every chronological appearance by release of Spider-Man from Amazing Fantasy 15 all the way to the modern age. You can also find exclusive shorts on YouTube there uh, as well as other bonuses for extra episodes that we do that don't end up on the podcast proper. So I want to see you over there on YouTube. Be sure to check out other Anazal Ministry Podcast AMP Network shows. You can see the whole network in a single feed if you're on Spotify, or you could go to Apple Podcasts and find the Anazal Ministries Network Podcast, the AMP Network Network. Yeah, there's just a network on Apple. You can follow the whole thing. You'll get shows like The Homily, where Pastor Will goes through his homily messages. It's literally just Pastor Will sermons, guys. It's great. You also get access to the Whole Church Podcast, where TJ and myself interview leaders from across different denominations and backgrounds to work towards a more full church unity. You can see My Seminary Life, where Brandon Knight discusses his experiences at seminary and then discusses seminary topics, so anyone can have access to knowledge available to seminary students. You also can see Let Nothing Move You over there, where Christian Ashley goes through the Bible in a Bible study type fashion and explains the whole biblical narrative. I also have a show on there, the Dummy for Theology, where we discuss various theological topics in an attempt to show every side of the discussions, leaving you with more questions than answers. There's also the Bible After Hours, where the foul mouth preacher goes through the Bible from a more progressive view to challenge the status quo of the modern church. Finally, you can hear the Clydes, where Taylor and Elizabeth Clyde go through weekly discussions in a devotional conversational style method to help us all get closer to one another and to God.